A very happy new year to you all. I've had a bit of time away, but I haven't been resting on my laurels. I have lots of videos coming up for you over the next few weeks. But in this video, as I kick off 2024, I want to introduce you to an object that, in my opinion, is one of the most beautiful works of art from the late Middle Ages. It is the crown, or more properly the coronet, of Margaret of York, Duchess of Burgundy. I remember first laying eyes on this coronet in 2003 in the Victoria and Albert Museum, where it had been brought from the Cathedral Treasury at Arken and was on display as part of the major exhibition on English art and architecture, Gothic Art for England. As you know, I do like shiny things, and it was one of my favourite objects in the exhibition. It is, without question, one of the finest surviving examples of the late medieval goldsmith's craft, and it may well have been made in England. And in this video, I will say a little bit about who Margaret of York was and her political significance, how this glorious coronet came to be made and its symbolism, and why it ended up in Arken. Margaret of York was the daughter of Richard, Duke of York, and his wife Cecily Neville, she was their sixth child and third daughter and was born on the 3rd of May 1446 here in her father's great castle at Fotheringay in Northamptonshire, close to the spot where Mary Queen of Scots would be executed over a century later. A member of the Plantagenet dynasty and the House of York, she was born during the turbulent reign of her father's kinsman, King Henry VI. In the 1450s, when Margaret was still very young, her father would become the major figurehead of the political opposition to King Henry VI. And between 1453 and 1455, when the king was incapacitated, he would act as protector of the crown and would be a major protagonist in the early years of the Wars of the Roses. Had he not died in December of 1460 at the Battle of Wakefield, Richard would likely have become king and Margaret, his young daughter, therefore a princess. In fact, in 1461, when she was 14, her elder brother Edward overthrew Henry VI and he became King Edward IV. And in time, her younger brother Richard, who had also been born at Fotheringay, would become King Richard III. Like her other siblings, Margaret's social position was transformed by her brother's accession in 1461. The surviving sons of Richard, Duke of York, all became royal dukes, and the daughters were all effectively treated as though they were the children of a king. With this new social position, Margaret became quite valuable to her family as a potential bride, for her marriage could bring the possibility of international alliances useful to England. At the time of King Edward IV's accession to the throne in 1461, over on the near continent, the Duchy of Burgundy, a wealthy state that included the Low Countries, was ruled by Duke Philip the Good. His son and heir was Charles the Bold, Count of Charolais, who despite having been married twice and in his 30s, had no male offspring. Charles the Bold's first marriage to Catherine of France had ended with her premature death, aged 18 in 1446. His second marriage was nearly a decade later to Isabella of Bourbon. In 1465, Isabella died, aged 31, of tuberculosis. She had given birth to a daughter, Mary, who in time would inherit the Duchy of Burgundy. There was, as was usual in the Middle Ages, uh, among the social elite, a degree of urgency for Charles the Bold to remarry to provide a male heir. The need for such an heir became somewhat more acute in 1467 when Charles succeeded his father as Duke of Burgundy. Now, before his accession in 1467, Charles had a limited choice of potential brides, for in 1435 his father had signed an agreement, the Treaty of Arras, with the French king. The treaty was a pretty complex affair, but for the purposes of this video it can be summarised thus. The Dukes of Burgundy thought of themselves as independent sovereigns, but they were in fact partly feudal vassals of the French crown for certain of their land holdings. In return for being released from their vassal status, Philip the Good agreed that during his lifetime his son Charles would only be allowed to marry French princesses. When Charles succeeded his father, he was free then to marry who he liked. And in 1468, King Edward IV of England offered to Charles the hand in marriage of his sister, Margaret of York. 
the English and the Burgundians had a long history of alliance. And in 1468, soon after his accession, Charles the Bold was only too happy to reignite that and bolster his connection with France's old enemy through a marriage to Margaret. There was a family connection too. Both Charles and Margaret were second cousins, as both were descendants of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster. They were married on the 3rd of July 1468 in a sumptuous ceremony in Darm near Bruges, by Richard Beecham, Bishop of Salisbury. Now, a courtier called Olivier de la Marche, a friend of Charles the Bold, was present and gave an eyewitness account of the reception of Margaret in the Low Countries and both the betrothal and the wedding and its aftermath. And the following part of his account relating to the day after the wedding refers to the beginning of her journey to Bruges after the wedding. My lady entered a horse litter, beautifully draped with cloth of gold. She was clad in white cloth of gold, made like a wedding garment, as was proper. On her hair rested a crown, and her other jewels were appropriate and sumptuous. The crown worn on her hair that day is most probably the coronet, now at Arken. The first thing to note about this object, this coronet is that it is a ducal coronet, as was understood in the 15th century, with a circlet topped with stylized strawberry leaves. The strict hierarchy and form of coronets that we saw at English coronations up until 1953 and also in heraldry had yet to be developed. The wearing of coronets by all ranks of the nobility had not been introduced by the 1460s. Earls were first granted coronets in the middle of the 16th century and viscounts and barons had to wait until the 17th century. The term coronet means, of course, little crown. And in the 14th and 15th centuries, the the wearing of a coronet was then generally indicative, although there are some exceptions, of the highest social status, royal status, though that gradually became eroded as time went on. Therefore, the coronet of Margaret of York was an ornament that reflected her status as a member of the English royal house, and as you might expect, expresses something of her origin. It is a tiny object, 13 centimetres high, and with a diameter of 12.5 centimetres. It isn't made of solid gold, but is of silver gilt, a common material for coronets. The coronet circlet is decorated with two strings of irregularly shaped freshwater pearls and onto it are set six sapphires in enamel settings in the form of Yorkist white roses. On the front of the coronet is a cross set with stones on a larger enamel white rose. The circlet is topped with eight strawberry leaves on tall stems and between them are little florons. The strawberry leaves are set with a range of precious stones, including sapphires and ballast rubies, and on the front strawberry leaf is a large ruby in a white rose setting. On the back of the coronet, occupying a similar position, is a square cut sapphire. The little fleurons have enamel roses on them. The object provides incontrovertible evidence that this item is associated with Margaret of York. Between the stone settings of the circlet is the inscription Margarita de York in white, red and green enamel. Above the top row of pearls are the initials C and M for Charles and Margaret, joined with a true lover's knot. And on the back of the circlet is Margaret's shield of arms, with the heraldic achievement of England impaling that of Burgundy. Now, some people have suggested in the past that the coronet was made in 1461 for Margaret for Edward IV's coronation. Given the decoration that refers so strongly to Margaret's relationship with Charles the Bold, this seems implausible, though you can't rule out the object being altered. It seems likely that it was made for the occasion of her marriage in 1468. Now the coronet is very small and it wouldn't circle the head. Olivier de la Marche says that Margaret wore a crown resting on her hair on the day after her marriage and this coronet would indeed be more of a hair or headdress ornament. 
That is, of course, the fashion of English peeresses' coronets from the 17th century onwards. They are hair ornaments rather than encircling the head. Whether the coronet was made in England or in the Low Countries is difficult to determine. We know from such objects as the Crystal Scepter of the Lord Mayor of London, see my video on that, that English goldsmiths in the 15th century were quite capable of producing work of this sort of quality. A quick mention should be made of the original case that contains the coronet. I can't for the life of me find a decent image of it, but you can see it in the background of this photograph. It's made of embossed and gilt leather, lined with red fabric, and is once again covered with evidence of the coronet's provenance. It bears the motto of Margaret, the arms of England and Burgundy, and the initials of Margaret and Charles. So how did the coronet end up in the cathedral treasury at Arken? Well, in Arken Cathedral is an important miracle-working cult image of the Virgin and Child, Our Lady of Arken. The image of Mary, which is 14th century, is adorned with clothing, and both Mary and the Christ child are generally crowned and dressed throughout the year. The importance of the image devotionally resulted in a large number of votive offerings being given to adorn it, and the image therefore has quite a collection of garments, crowns and ornaments. The coronet of Margaret of York survives as it is within the image's collection. We know that in 1474, Margaret paid a pilgrimage to Arken, and it is possible that she offered her coronet as a votive offering during her visit. It has been suggested that the crown may have been made to be an offering to the image, and was never worn by Margaret. We will never know for certain, but the balance of probability suggests it was an object she owned and treasured. The gift of such personal objects as votives was not uncommon in this period. The white roses on the coronet were a very appropriate symbol for a crown to be worn by an image of the Virgin as well as a coronet worn by a Yorkist princess. For white roses were a common symbol of Mary's purity. Thank goodness Margaret made this gift for it is only through the gift that this beautiful object, a rare example of 15th century courtly goldsmith's work, survives. So what happened to Margaret of York in later life? Her husband, Charles the Bold, died fighting the united forces of the Duke of Lorraine and the Swiss in the bitter cold of January 1477. His body was found frozen in a ditch. Having no children of her own and not providing the longed-for male heir, her 20-year-old stepdaughter Mary of Burgundy inherited her father's lands. As Dowager Duchess of Burgundy, she proved a wise and politically astute adviser to her stepdaughter. It was she who advised Mary to marry the future Emperor Maximilian I, a marriage that brought Burgundy to the House of Habsburg. When Mary of Burgundy died, well before the majority of her son, Philip the Handsome, Margaret of York for a time ruled Burgundy and was the joint guardian of the young duke. She lived into the 16th century and saw Philip the Handsome come into his Burgundian birthright. She died aged 57 in November of 1503, by which time all the world had changed and both Burgundy and her native England were under the rule of a very different regime. She was buried in the monastic church of the Cordeliers, the Franciscans of the Strict Observance, in Mechelen. Sadly, her tomb has long since vanished. Thanks for watching. I have some copies left of January's issue of The Antiquary magazine. The Antiquary is a beautiful publication printed each month in full colour. People have remarked that it's like receiving a coffee table book in miniature every month. Broad in its historical subject matter, this month I take readers on a tour of the Norman sculpture at Kilpack Church in Herefordshire. I look at the uncompleted monument and the grave of King Edward IV at Windsor and explore the origin of the word hearse and the towering candle-filled structures of that name used at funerals in medieval Europe. Why not get a copy or even subscribe 
Subscriptions help me continue to bring you more interesting content on this channel.